This is Amateur Logic, episode 175, for November 15th, 2022. This episode of Amateur Logic is brought to you by MFJ, the world's leaders in ham radio accessories, and by ICOM. Contest season is here. Keep your competitive contesting edge with ICOM. <laughs> Good evening. Welcome to another episode of Amateur Logic. I'm George. I'm Tommy. I'm Emil and Mike. <laughs> now and, your special guest, Kay Savitz. Hey, there we go. <laughs> Hi. So we've got a special show for you lined up tonight. Not only is it uh, coming up on Turkey Day. Yep. We've we've got some uh, special features tonight. Mike is in the wings, as email is indicating there. Uh, <laughs> He'll be with us here shortly. Uh, let's let's just run around and see what we're going to talk about tonight. Tommy, what is going to be your segment? Well, I, I've got an update on the uh, battery charger situation I showed uh, about a year and a half ago. I mm -hmm. thought that might, people might be interested in that. Okay. Cool. Emil, what have you got? Uh, well, let's see. The uh for you Pi Star MMDVM hotspot users, there's a new API version out from Brandmeister that they're trying to push everybody to upgrade to. So that's what I'm going to be talking about. Cool. Cool. And sad note here, we'll be talking about a little later. Uh, good friend of ours and of the show, uh, Andy Anderson, AA0WX, became a silent key uh, in the last few days here. And he is... Surely going to be missed. Andy was a great guy, and uh, mm -hmm. we visited with him here and in person a number of times. Mm -hmm. And Mike put together a little tribute of some of that footage we'll be looking at a little later in the show. Cool. Uh, but let's get on into it right now. A special guest tonight is Kay Savitz from, well, out near Portland. And Kay has a special relationship with amateur radio that is still developing right now well, he's been a ham for a while but this is um this is something new that i think we can all get behind it's um well i'll just let Kay tell you Kay, what what are you doing now that uh some of our viewers may be interested in Sure. Um, I work for the Internet Archive, and my job is to build the digital library of amateur radio and communications. Uh, I've been doing this for a couple of months. This is funded by uh, a grant by ARDC, the Amateur Radio Digital Communication Foundation. Um, and they, what we're doing is we are trying to create the ultimate online library of amateur radio. Um, I have been at this for a couple of months, and I we have already gotten more than 22,000 individual items, and I'm here to talk to your viewers, and hopefully there are people out there who have other uh, information, books, magazines, newsletters, podcasts, and whatnot that we can uh, add to the library to make this the go-to spot for everything ham radio online. Well, I think most of us here are, are very familiar with archive.org. It's yeah. a, a great resource there for, um, well, for history. And, you know, as you mentioned, there are not just videos, but uh, podcasts, uh, documents, photos, uh Wow, just about anything you'd like mm -hmm. to know about. Yeah, books, books and magazines and, and stuff on microfilm and yeah. microfiche. Uh, Internet Archive has been around for 26 years now. Wow. Um, it, a lot of people, if you don't know of the Internet Archive, you've probably heard about of the Wayback Machine, which is like mm -hmm. it's 
killer app, um, which is the thing that lets you look at websites that don't exist anymore or or how websites used to be. Uh, but Internet Archive is way more than the Wayback Machine. There are uh, Internet Archive has 100 petabytes of information. Wow. 100 Yeesh. petabytes Gross. of of information, which which ranges from from uh, uh, millions and millions of books to to digitized uh, seventy eight records to uh, microfilm to uh, um, uh, concerts that you know uh, all sorts of all anything just like the whole whole realm of everything. Um, but my job is just to like bolster the the ham radio uh, material. There was a grant that's uh, helping fund this just just recently here that came out that's uh, helping make this possible. Right. The ARDC uh, is is funding the grant and what they are are doing, like I said, we're trying to create this library. Um, the grant covers um, a lot of stuff, including um, shipping and digitization. So say you have a bookshelf filled with uh, old amateur radio books that or magazines that you don't need anymore uh, or your club has uh, a file cabinet filled with newsletters that is going back for 20 or more years or whatever it is um, that has never been digitized um, we you can ship that to us um, and you can you know donate that to us and we can um, uh, digitize all of it the Internet Archive has has high speed uh, scanning machines that will digitize um, material, like digitize books, say without harming them, without cutting off the spines or anything, and then we get them online, um, and then we can make them available to the world, um, to 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 view. Um, so you're looking at the at the site now. Uh, consider this now. You are looking at a library that. Uh, as it's being built, right? I'm working on getting the material, but man, this this is going to be better organized and it's going to be uh, prettier. And but this is, you know, what I'm just throwing stuff to the wall right now and see what we have. Um, you'll notice that there's a bunch of uh, 73 magazines. We have the entire mm -hmm. run of 73 magazines. Um, Wayne Green uh, gave permission uh, for us to have it. He donated a, a his entire library of 73 to us and it's online and you can view them, um, download the PDFs or whatever and, and enjoy them. Um, there's also, um, if someone says donate um, a, a book to us, um, in fact, you can go to the, the link that I sent you guys there. It says library lending link. We have, um, I think it was the second one I sent. Uh, there are right now hundreds of books available, and we use something called controlled digital lending. So say it's a book that was published only a few years ago. It's still copyrighted. Um, we scan it. Um, say we have one copy of the book. We make it available uh, to one person at a time. Um, you basically can borrow it for an hour or for you know up to a couple of weeks, and you could read the book on your screen and... Um, and then when you're done with it, it goes to the next person. So we're making 100 years of uh, ham radio books available online. Um, right now, there's only a couple hundred, but there are um, many more headed their way, on their way to the scanning center that have been donated that will be scanned soon and also made available. So if somebody, you know, is setting on some material that, that they would like to share. They've been wondering, what am I going to do with this? You know, mm -hmm. I, I need it preserved somehow or, or share it with other people. Tell us about the various ways they could do that. And, you know, should they lend it to you? Should they donate it? And what's the uh, repercussions from either way? Sure. Um, for, the first thing to do for any of those things is to email me because I, I am the I'm the gatekeeper who decides uh, what goes into the library. And you can email me at k that's k a y at archive dot org, and that'll get get straight to me. Um, so if you have stuff that you don't want anymore, you can donate it to us, and we will scan it. Like I said, make it available you know, under controlled digital lending, or if it's public domain, it will just be free and clear. Uh, if it's material, say, uh, that you have created or your club has created, um, we'll say newsletters, right? Your club, club has created newsletters. They've, they're on paper. Uh, they've never been digitized. You could lend those to us. And since you have, you have 
permission you know for those you you own the material you can lend them to us we'll scan them get them online with with your okay and um and send them back um people have sent let me show you uh i sent you a thing called florida skip uh, it's one of the links i i sent you this was really an interesting one so this is this is a a newsletter that was out of florida uh started in the 1960s um you can click on any of those if you if you want to and and see a nice and these are all not only scanned but also ocr um you can full text search you know so i don't know maybe your grandpa was a was a ham in you know in the 1920s or something you can you can find him you know being mentioned um so someone (laughs) um Wrote to me and said they had this this the, these piles of, of of Florida skip newsletters that he had already digitized and do I want them? I'm like sure, great. So he sent them to me, and um, these were published by a, a man named uh, Andy Clark, who is the silent key now. Uh, but I found his son, who is also named Andy Clark and is also a ham, and he said, sure, you know, love to have put the stuff online. He's like, I think I have more in the basement or the attic or something. So. Um, so we have like 70 newsletters, and uh, Andy Jr. Uh, just wrote to me the other day and said he found a bunch more issues in in the uh, in the attic, and he is uh, donating them to us, and we're going to scan them all. So we're going to have a more or less complete archive of of this particular uh, Florida-based amateur newsletter. So that's an old one. Um, and we also have, I sent you a link um, to the, the uh, Sark Communicator. I think it was the f- last, the final link that I, I sent you. Um, and this is a, a, a modern group um, out of uh, uh, Canada, British Columbia. And they have been publishing this this newsletter every month for many years. And um, they're available on their website, And but they decided yeah, put it up on archive too. It it uh, uh, increases the availability of this information and uh, it kind of guarantees that you know if whatever their website should somehow go away, hopefully archive.org never will. Um, so so the whole all of this this more you know modern newsletters is up there too. Many uh, clubs have written to me and uh, and given given the okay to put their newsletters online and so. Um, we've done, we're doing newsletters, we're doing podcasts, we're doing video podcasts. I need to talk to you guys about uh, mirroring uh, uh, amateur logic um, as well. Um, and so, well, I want this to be the, the one-stop shop for all ham radio. And it looks like it's certainly shaping up I that mean, way. I had no idea all this was Oh, yeah, man. It's, uh... I, I knew there's a lot of, lot of uh, cool information out there, but I never really looked at much into the amateur radio stuff. Ooh, I will. Ooh, 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 oh, email. <laughs> um, it's awesome. He's already starting to ask. I mean, answer some of the questions that I had. Um, our club has newsletters going back to 1967, right? Wow. And I yeah. know we have our own historian in the club. And I was wondering on a lot of it is already digitized. Is there a minimum or a published minimum standard, like say, like resolution or format that you like? If we're doing the work or have already done some of it? it, it if you've already done the work, then the work is done. I'm not going to go, oh, I'm sorry, the resolution's too low. I can't take that. It, you know, if I, every, most everything is people are giving me is in PDF format, which is great. It's fine. Um, it's fine. It's great. You know, I, I would, if it was me, I would, I would be, dig, I, when I digitize things, I do them at 600 DPI. I use the TIFF format. I don't like lossy formats. That's me. But you know what? If you have 200 DPI scans in 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 PDF format, great. I'm happy to add them. You know, there's. I'm not gonna. Uh, the fact that you did the work is is amazing. Or if you if you want it done better, we can probably talk about that too. We can, you know, what well, we use our high resolution scanning magic and uh, and do that too. All right. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. So. Okay, how do you scan it? I'm, I assume you don't have an Epson or an HP scanner. No, oh, I meant, I'm sorry, I meant to send you the, send you the link. Um, let me see if I can find it real fast. Um, we, they have uh, scanning centers. Wow. This, this machine does not mess around. It's just boom, 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 you know. She, I have never seen such. That's really cool. Yeah. That's not your HP at home, George. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, yeah, that's it's a amazing machine. 
Well, if I had, if you had to do that on the flatbed scanner, man, that would just be torture. <laughs> oh yeah. So is is there a camera overhead, or what's actually doing? Yeah, I, be- I believe they use uh, two cameras, um, one pointing at each page, like crosswise. Yeah. Well, I had wondered, you know, how everything was so square and, you know, looked yeah. like really flat pages and and well aligned, and mm-hmm. well, this explains it. That's really yeah. Fast. This that's how they do it, and I think you know they can if it's something's askew or whatever they can fix it in software. Although they they really they try to get it right the first time, and uh, then we add all the metadata and the you know the ISBNs and the author and and whatever, and then of course they go through the the full text search. Um, so that uh, even if you don't know what book you want or who wrote it, you can just go to the DLARC archive and type, uh, you know, and antenna, balan, you know, whatever keywords you're looking for, and then it'll it'll show you things that that might be relevant to what you want. Uh, we're also working on this is new newish. Uh, we're working on um, using uh, Whisper AI to digitize audio so say there was a podcast or even a radio show or something about ham radio um then we'll be able to to uh uh transcribe i said digitize before i meant transcribe transcribe the audio so that um uh you can find things mentioned in in a in a video or an audio or something like that wow fantastic email are you um are you liking the the cost ratio you know, of of this well, yeah yes absolutely the cost to me especially <laughs> that's phenomenal the amount of uh, professionalism going into that especially for the cost going to me i suppose there's ways to uh help out your cause uh sure i mean like i said this is all covered by uh by by the the grant the generous grant from uh, the ardc um but uh, Internet Archive is a nonprofit, and if you make, if you're in the U.S. and you make a donation, uh, your donation is tax deductible. Archive.org/donate, and uh, it's a great. Group. I said, uh, I've, I've said this before, but it's really true. I went from being uh, Internet Archive's biggest fan to its newest employee. Um, I've been there a couple of months now. I'm no longer the newest employee, but um, I've been using Internet Archive for a decade, um, and learning the ins and outs and everything. And that way, when this job came for, you know, needed a, a ham to do stuff, like I, I know how to do this. I know the systems and, and the command line interfaces and all the secret backdoor so, uh, tools. So I have, I have a question. I see, uh, there, there's material from all over the world in here, but most mm-hmm. of the, what I see here, English speaking, what if it's uh, German or whatever it, you guys, do absolutely you, sure. Do you translate that as well. Yeah. Um, the, I mean, ham radio, as you know, is an international hobby. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the if a, if we get a, a a book or newsletter or a podcast in French or German or any other language, we will happy to digitize it and put it online. Will it get translated? No, probably not. I mean, <laughs> no. Um, okay. But uh, it'll be there for you. You can learn German and and. Uh, figured out awesome. well, so and we're talking about ham radio here and this is a really a brand new project i mean there's mm-hmm. there's been some ham radio content on there but there yeah. was i guess there was really no concerted effort yeah it was it was ad hoc kind of all over the place yeah. and like part one of my job I mean, day one what i started to do is figuring out like what was what did we already have and and get that organized you know and mm-hmm. and is it you know, legit or is it kind of, you know, how 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 squishy or legit is it, and where should be? Let me show you about this. What you're you're talking? Um, this is something I I barely put my toe into the the software water, but this is something we're go- we're going to keep doing. Is uh, is someone donated a bunch of old, uh, mostly packet radio software uh, mm-hmm. on on discs, right? On on three and a half inch discs. I'm like, yeah, I'll take it. So I digitize the discs and put them online, and so now. You can download this software um, and you know uh, get the data off it, run it, whatever. And I'll show you. Some, one of them is really uh, some of them, a couple of them. Uh, scroll down to the uh, repeater directory. It's third. It's in the middle on the bottom row. Um, some of them make it makes sense to. You can run them. Hit hit the big button, the big green button. Uh, you can run them in an emulator. 
uh, right oh. from your browser. Oh, awesome. So if there's this old ham radio software, you can try it without installing anything. Just right there in your browser. Um, so <laughs> How cool is that? Yeah, isn't that amazing? So this is a repeater directory from Incredible. 1994 that someone someone uploaded uh, a few months ago. And uh, you can just run the software. Some of the software, it just doesn't make sense. A lot of the software uh, that I uploaded uh, recently was uh, uh, like packet radio software that that expects uh, you know a certain piece of hardware to mm -hmm. be attached and then it crashes because there's no... You know, yeah. there's no serial yeah. line really attached. Um, so, but this one is a good demonstration. You can use this this yeah. software from 1994. Yeah, that's very yeah. cool. I, I was uh, I saw software on here the other day when I uh, found out you were coming. Looked around. And I, I used to run JNOS a lot, and I saw mm -hmm. it on here. Um, actually, yeah, right it's here. Uh, a couple versions so, of of, uh, of JNOS are are there. The yeah. blue disc right on top. Yeah. Yep. And you um, wouldn't necessarily have to be running DOS on uh, on your PC to do this. These days, you can d uh, do it with uh, ESP32 or Raspberry Pi. Um, mm -hmm. while, uh, or DOS, even DOSBox. I use DOSBox DOS Box. on my Mac all the mm -hmm. time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. You don't need a Windows machine to run old DOS software. Yeah, this is awesome. Um, yeah. It kind of brings back a lot of old memories, too, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pretty cool stuff. Everything was bleeding edge back then. Yeah. It's amazing how fast things were changing. I mean, they still are, but I don't know. Do it's... you recall seeing YAPP, Y-A-P-P, -P, in that collection there? Not yet. I don't think I've seen that yet. Okay. Um, but like I said, it was only about 25 discs I've done so far. So um, what is YAPP? Tell me. Yeah, uh, yet, another yet another packet, packet protocol. protocol. It's uh, <laughs> a way you can do file transfers over packet hmm. and we used it back in the uh i guess early 90s to to send files back and forth between uh you know some hams in this area you know it, back in those days we were still paying my bell long distance charges and it, it was a great way to you know get uh, share a piece of software or text or whatever with your buddy you know in the next county over so neat Awesome. Yeah. I'm sure I'll we'll we'll come across it and I'll get it online for you. It wasn't the fastest yeah. thing in the world, but it worked. No, but it worked. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was cool. You know, I got Z modem to work one time on packet, but only one transfer could ever work. Uh, Z modem. Oh, wow, yeah. we're going back. Yeah. It, it, you know, I was um saying earlier, you know, the, the amateur radio collection is just now starting to come together, although it's been there a while. But there is so much stuff on archive.org that uh, that that we've all watched a lot of old uh, Navy and Army films and uh, mm -hmm. uh, courses on electronics. Just just amazing resources out there mm -hmm. that that uh, people with this type of affliction really like to <laughs> you know really like to watch and yeah. and research. So we really appreciate what y'all are doing there. And um, I was, Tommy, last night I went on the Wayback Machine. I just had to check and see. You remember we started a company back in the uh, early 90s. Yeah. And I guess the first time our website was crawled by the Wayback Machine was, uh, was it 96, I think? Anyway, I found it on there, cartworks.com. Yeah. And we were talking wow. about the new software that now runs on Windows 95 and you know, <laughs> how much of a benefit that is. Talking uh, about bleeding edge, huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and you even mentioned, you know, the possibility of sending audio files between uh, radio stations over the Internet. You know, you just created that, uh, what was it, Web Jockey? Whatever the name of that yeah. piece of software was. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> nice. so much. Uh, we were ahead of our time. Great stuff out there. Um, nice. Okay, is anything else um, that we haven't covered yet that, that we really uh, should? No, I guess I my, my two my two things is, is number one, I, I want to, as long as I have you here, I want to make sure that it's okay. I could put Amateur Logic uh, mirror that over there. But 
I saw your, your Creative Commons, so I don't even need your permission, oh, yeah. really. Yeah. <laughs> well, definitely, yeah, Creative Commons. We uh, started with that license when we first uh, started doing the video 17 years ago. We, we looked into, you know, what you need to do for licensing, and that seemed like that, that was a good way like to go. Yeah. For us. Yeah. yeah. I love I love me some Creative Commons. That's there's some so much good stuff. All right, well I'll I'll, I'll get working on that and I'll let you know uh, when when that's mirrored. Make you a little collection. Okay. And uh, yeah, the other thing I just wanted to reiterate is is I'm looking for uh, material to to add. I mean that's 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 100% of what I'm doing right now. Um, so if if your viewers, if your listeners have material that either either physical items that they want to donate. Or they have created something such as a podcast or an ebook or a newsletter or whatever that they want to give give us permission to to uh, add um, to email me at k k a y at archive dot org and uh, we'll get it done. Cool. I'm gonna hit you here on the lower third with the email address. Great. Uh, and Tommy, I, I hadn't mentioned it to you yet, but. Uh, uh, Kay said we could just send him the video files and the metadata, and he will okay. he will take care of getting all of that on the archive.org oh, awesome. so we can get get all the episodes on there a whole lot quicker than that. Well, uh, that'd be good. Save a lot of time. Oh, yeah. yeah, it will. You thinking about the wiki information as the metadata, George? Uh, probably. Um, or we can just suck it straight out of uh, WordPress. It might take a little uh, deciphering. Yeah. It's to... also in the RSS feeds. Oh, yeah, it is, isn't it? Yeah. That might be a good way. Is there a preferred format for that, Kay? Um, for the, either text or, or I can extract from RSS feeds pretty easily. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's just XML. They're pretty easy to manipulate. Yeah. Yeah, a little little code to take it out of XML, put it back into archive. Not a big deal. Happy to do it. Cool. That'll be great. And let me just update this on screen real quick one time. So uh did they have an amateur radio section before before you started or did you start that part? I know there was some material out there. The the no, there was not like a concentrated amateur radio section. And if you want to see what we have now, uh, I probably should have said this before. It's at archive.org slash details slash D-L-A-R-C, Digital Library of Amateur Radio and Communication. That's the first URL they tried to give me was Digital Library of Amateur Radio and Communication. So I'm like, no, <laughs> please. Can I have a shorter version, please? <laughs> uh, so that's where you can see what we have so far. Like I said, you're in the library as we're building it. So uh, there may be sawdust here and there um but uh that is that is what you can see what we have now like yeah like you like you said there was there was stuff it was just mm -hmm. not in any one location so now i've kind of moved collections into one location then of course i'm adding more things um we've scanned um, um many magazines and uh many books and the people in, in the scanning center in fort wayne have a huge mm -hmm. I mean, a, a bookshelf just like teeming of stuff ready to go uh ready for them to, to scan so i think uh, uh early next year we're going to see it just explode and i see you've got an rss feed so we can uh, subscribe and get notified when new materials added yeah actually I haven't <clears throat> excuse me i haven't tried that but yes you should that should work cool and uh, you're you're in the portland area they're scanning the books in Fort Wayne. Where's, where's just curious, where's the data? The, uh, data, the data center, the main data center is in San Francisco. Okay. Um, yeah. They they have a, a, a look, like a Internet Archive's main location is in San Francisco in a former church. It is a big, beautiful building with, that still has the pipe organ and the pews. And, wow. uh, uh, and, the, and the data center is like in the back of the, the room of the, the former church Oh, nice. Room. It's oh, pretty amazing. Sounds cool. So, yeah. Kay, thank you for being with us tonight. And, and once again, if you'd like to email Kay with any questions or uh, maybe some resources you'd like to share or donate, uh, send them to Kay at archive.org. And we appreciate you being here. We'd like to check back with you in the future as this thing grows and and find out just uh, what direction it's gone and, yeah. and maybe 
you know, things people would be interested in looking at. Great. I would love to, uh, to check back in with you in a couple months and uh, let you know how it's going. Yeah, sounds great. Cool. Let's do that. Thanks for great. taking the time to join. Thank us. you so much yeah. for your time. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Kay. 7-3, Kay. 7-3, Kay. 7-3. Okay, Tommy, I have an email here. Oh, by the, yeah, what were you saying? I was just saying, that's that's really awesome. I, I didn't know they had kind of an initiative going for that. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. I saw they had received a grant, mm -hmm. um, but I, I didn't really know. You know, we started uh, posting a few of the amateur logics on mm -hmm. there, and uh, they wrote me, and uh, wow, I'm glad he did, because this was, this was really good stuff. Yeah, really cool. I got an email that says, George and Tommy and the whole gang at ALTV. I enjoyed your 17th anniversary show. Congratulations on a still excellent show. I try to encourage all hams to give it a go. I wanted to thank you for showing the Irwin Vice Grip wire strippers. He said he's had several different types and brands, and none of them have lasted very long, nor did a very good job. I'm hoping after watching that segment on them that the, uh, the pair I ordered tonight will come soon as I have some wires that need stripping. It was great to see Peter again. Hope that email will be back next month. Got to have my cheap old man fixed. 7-3 from Dennis, KK0DJ. And Dennis, I bought a pair of these after seeing Tommy's and how much fun he was having. Uh, and how well they worked, I was thinking, you know, I've never seen automatic wire strippers that that, that I work. thought were worth the flip, yeah. And these seemed to look pretty nice in, what, $20 at Lowe's? Yeah. I picked up a pair. The first two things I tried to strip with it, though, <laughs> was was not very good. They are not good for stripping coax. I've never tried coax with them. Yeah, well, let me say, they're not very good at stripping <laughs> coax. And uh, I tried to uh, strip some ends off of some Cat5 cable, just, just the individual conductors. I just needed a tiny little amount I was going to solder in a connector. And it was a little short for these to grab. You know, you got the gauge there mm -hmm. where you can adjust it. But um, I needed something a little bit shorter, but... I tried other things with it, and uh, boy, they 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 do it every time and never nicks a wire. And I mm -hmm. I got to studying it quicker. There's not really a blade in there. No, it's just kind of a. I think it makes a little perforation there, and then it just kind of pops it off. Yeah, I mean it's um, it's pretty amazing for twenty bucks. I'd sure. say, uh, yeah, Dennis, you you probably already have those, and you're liking them now. So, Mike. You were watching all of that. What do you think? That's awesome. And I was in the chat room, and uh, I had made a comment that the uh, Wayback Machine has saved my bacon more than once. Yes. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's a, it's a great resource. You really wouldn't think that that old uh, stuff would come in handy, but it but it really does. The right circumstance. It's also kind of fun just to go back and look through history. Yeah. I think I've browsed through every copy or every issue of 73 magazine. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, I've looked at a lot of them. Uh, Mike, you had, uh, well, today is a special day, and you brought it up. Y'all have a different name for it up there, but let's let's just talk about that real quick. Yeah, up here, it's uh, it's Remembrance Day, or or some people refer to it as Poppy Day. And in the U.S., um, I guess you have a different month. I think it's a Memorial Day in the spring over there. That's yeah. kind of the same thing as a Remembrance Day. But uh, today you're celebrating Veterans Day. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and I uh, actually learned something to here today, too, because I was at a Remembrance Day service. And uh, originally it was known, known as Amicis Day. Um, and it was to honor those who gave up their lives uh, during the First World War. Uh, but now um, it's kind of extended here as well to uh, active service men and, and women that uh, served um, 
in in multiple different wars, World War II, uh, the Korean War, and um, Afghanistan, uh, and such. So, um, so yeah, it's it's kind of kind of grown closer into a Veterans Day as well as Remembrance Day. Yeah, we we salute all our our veterans of all the yeah. wars. Yeah, if you've if you have served or are serving, we really appreciate your your service. Yep. Thank you for our freedom. Tommy, what have you got there? Well, I had a segment planned for you guys this month that I was going to do outside, but it's quite rainy today, and I don't really think I ought to go out there and do it in the rain. So I'm going with plan B. There was a lot of interest in one of my uh, reviews I did about a year and a half ago. I think it was in June of 2021, maybe sometime around that time frame. But I, I did a review of this X-Star VC4S battery charger. It's a great charger. It had one major problem, though, that kept it from being what I consider a perfect charger. You cannot control the amount of current that you're charging the batteries with. So the one I bought came with the 3 amp quick charge uh, wall power break that's plugged in over here. And if you only need to charge one or two batteries, these little small AA batteries like this, you could basically cook the batteries. So you could mitigate that by putting a smaller wall board on there to, to power it that limit the amount of current that's coming through. Or you could put more batteries in. And that's what I've been doing since I got this charger. Uh, it's kind of a little bit of a hassle though sometimes. Well, not long after this, uh, I did that review, a viewer told me about an updated one, the VC4SL. And it's been out of stock. I had it in my cart for a while on Amazon I finally noticed it was in stock so I went ahead and ordered one it came in pleasantly surprised it may be uh, in my opinion at least to me the perfect battery charger for for my needs anyway so let's take a look at it it's got basically the same functionality as the other one for the most part it can uh, limit the amount of current that you're charging with though and you can have it's got four places to charge, as you can see. You can put different batteries in there. So I'll put a, a AAA in one side, if I can get it on there from here. I've got a little cheap Amazon 18650 that I bought, Ultra Fire knockoff. Uh, it's supposed to be 3,000 milliamp hours, but it rates rated at 395. So uh, don't waste your money and get those, by the way. So let's go ahead and put that in. I've also got some of these uh, 14500 little ultra fire batteries. Again, these came from Amazon, but these must not be knockoffs because they're pretty good. I paid a good bit of money for them. But they, they fit my one of my MFJ bat, uh, antenna analyzers. And then I've got these that I harvested from a, a laptop. If you take a closer look, you can see that it shows the type of chemistry of each battery. Might be a little difficult to see. Nickel metal hydride, lithium ion, lithium ion, lithium ion. So you can mix some of the chemistries in here and the battery types, charge them at one time. We still got the same functionality. We've got uh, the ability to change it to, for, to display the current, capacity, and the internal resistance of the battery. You can also do the modes as the other one to, to uh, grade it which will actually charge the battery up, discharge it down to what is, should be a normal discharge voltage, and measure the amount that it, that it used to get to that point, and then charge it back off for you and leave it topped off. Uh, there's a storage mode too. To change modes, you can just hold down this button over here. Hold it down one time, it changes to grade, which will charge the battery up, drain it back down to a normal, what it considers a dead voltage, a safe dead voltage for the battery, and keep track of how much it used from the battery so it can display the capacity, and then it'll charge it back up for you and leave it topped off. One more press of that button, it'll go to storage, which will discharge and show you the voltage that it is. This one's already done, because this battery was dead before I put it in here. I've, I've let it sit up and charge, so. It can't go down any farther. 
but it's a pretty nice charger. Let's go back to one of the regular charging modes. Uh, we're on capacity. Let's uh, take a look. You can see the voltage of the batteries. Down here, you can see the amount of current going into the battery. So to change that, tap this left button here, and you can see we're charging at a rate of 200 250 milliamp hours per battery. Change it again, we're at 3,000 or 3 amps, 2,000, 1,000, or 500 milliamps, which is a half of an amp, or 250. Now that's that's good because uh, you don't really want to charge these small batteries and have them built up heat to decrease the life of your battery. I think I've lost a few of these because of that. Um, I had to toss a few of these or send them to the recycle place recently because uh, some of these just didn't hold up. Could have been a bad battery or it could have been cooked. I'm not really sure. At any rate, uh, it's a cool charger. The I got this one, like I said, off of Amazon. It was uh, 31 bucks uh, plus tax. So 30, what, about $34, $33, something like that. While I had the other one and it was functional, as much as I use it for the price, it was worth it to me to upgrade. I know a lot of you bought this battery charger, the other one, after... Uh, did my review so I figure there might be some interest in this updated version It's essentially the same price as the other one uh, just got more functionality And you can buy it a little bit cheaper if you get it without the uh, quick charge wall wart But I knew I was going to be doing a comparison of the two So I went ahead and paid a couple extra bucks and got the other wall wart for mine So I could have them both plugged up but At any rate, I uh, hope you find it useful and uh 73. See you next time. That Perfect. did look useful. Yeah. Well, it's, it's almost the same charger I did before. I almost didn't do it, but it was the, it fixed the one big flaw in the other one. I, I thought it was worth at least bringing up. Mm -hmm. Plus my other segment got rained out. So there was a, there was a comment in the chat room for you, Tommy, and it had to do with the fact that you st still got the plastic protection on yours as well. So do you going to make it cringe right now? You know, I was telling George, I saw that and I was going to bring it up, but don't, uh, I leave it on there because it came with a nice bag, but I don't put it in the bag. I just drop it in the drawer and there's a bunch of cables. So I figure I'll get more life out of it. If it scratches up the plastic, then I'll pull the plastic off and I can wait till I scratch up the glass and I can't see it anymore. So yeah, it plus it, vi yep, it videos uh, better too with that matte plastic than that shiny glass. x -tar. I don't. I've only got the two uh, two cell charger version, so I'm probably going to have to pick up one of those four ones. But that uh, the fact the fact that you can change the current going into the batteries now it's uh, that's to me that was worth the thirty bucks to just in itself. You're you're right about the charging current on those smaller like triple A's, for example. Um, they get really hot doing a fast charge on those. Yeah, you'll t you'll wreck them, toast them if you if they get too hot. So what I've been doing before, like I did in my other segment, was I'd take a small wall wart and I'd take that quick charge one off and put a small one on there mm. that had a lower amount of current. But it's kind of a hassle to deal with that. It, it was functional, but uh, I don't know. I, I use the thing probably a couple times a week. I go through quite a few, quite a few AA batteries. So anyway, it's worth wow. it to me. You just like consuming energy over there like crazy. Burning man. it up, man. <laughs> <laughs> burning it up it's free oh free energy You're using the solar stuff no. <laughs> should yeah i should too i still haven't even got mine out and charged yeah, i was hoping you're going to do a segment on that thing man that's pretty neat i'd like to see how well it works yeah we ought to have a smackdown and compare that one to the other one yeah solar well, panel smackdown you know when i i bought that panel at uh huntsville it rained like every day for a month after that yeah so. <laughs> he, he could use his shirt, George. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was going to mention the shirt. I saw. I see Eric's in the uh, chat room tonight too. This is the uh, Soundcheck Net. Uh, what the heck is it? Picture answer shirt. <laughs> that is the universal answer. It is correct. If, if you don't have the other one, this one will do. If you don't have the mm -hmm. right answer, it's a it's flux capacitor, or some variation of it. It's sort of like punning. 
Right. Pretty much. Yeah. Okay, Mike, you had a, an unusual, well, a UFO type of email tonight, I think. You wanted to share with us. It wasn't an email, it was a post. Yeah, it was a uh, an article from the uh, IEEE uh, Spectrum ma magazine. And uh, this is kind of like the fear and bane of all pilots, all those pilots out there in the chat room. You can relate to this. Apparently, uh, bird strikes are probably the number one problem for pilots. And um, over the years, typically what uh, airports have done is they've hired local, um, I, get, I don't know what you call them, falconry or falconists um, to uh, fly their, fal their, their, their birds around like falcons and, and uh, eagles. Actually, I, I was talking with a, a fellow that uh, did the big airport in Toronto, Pearson Airport, and he uses a golden eagle. And he says that golden eagle will even take down a deer. So wow. um, this is kind of electronic spin on that. Somebody's came up with kind of like a, well, it looks like a falcon, but it's it's like a like an RC plane, I guess more so than than say a drone. And they fly this around, and the birds <laughs> think it's a real falcon, and it scares the birds away. Wow. So it does a trick. It's pretty I, interesting. Hey, I bet that will work in my yard for squirrels. <laughs> I bet. Like I mentioned last time, I saw one get a squirrel. Oh yeah, uh, it was a hawk actually. Got a squirrel in my front yard. But he he, yeah. he didn't come back for the rest of the buffet. I don't know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> Did I understand Vulcan? Falcon. 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 That's that Canadian accent he said he didn't have. <laughs> okay. No, don't say Vulcan. You'll get it, and they'll all excited thinking of yeah. Star Trek. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so that's an interesting device there. On the top of the model Vulcan. There's a camera, and so um, apparently uh, they fly that in kind of like a first-person uh, mode and um, with, I guess, some kind of overhead display, whether it's goggles or what have you, or if it's on a, um, a, a tablet screen or something. But um, they fly from a first-person view uh, from what, what you're flying. So he, I guess they get paid to chase the birds around with a model airplane. Wow. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that topic, Mike. Uh, my father-in-law, he works for the Department of Agriculture in D.C., and one of his uh, duties, its it no longer is, he's, uh, um, I think he's a desk jockey more or less now, but uh, one of his jobs was uh, handling bird strikes. Really? Yep. And, you know, they planned out ways to handle them. And, you know, he's talked about uh, different things they did. They will take dishwashing liquid and, you know, mix it with water. And if there's a lot of birds in a tree, you know, at, near an airport, they will squirt them with that. And the birds can't fly. And they'll fall to the ground. And they just go around and gather them up and take them off. Interesting. It doesn't hurt the birds, you know, just, uh, well, I guess falling fall out of the sky. Like, probably doesn't feel like, too good. Yeah. <laughs> falling out of a tree. It's better than being hit by a 747, though. <laughs> so, <laughs> In comparison. Yeah. So, you know, he's told us about a lot of different, uh, you know, things that they did. Morse code dates back to the days of the wire telegraph and the beginning of radio. Although it's no longer required, many hams find it a relaxing mode of communications. In fact, there are many advantages to using CW once you've learned the code. The MFJ419 CW Elmer is a multifunction training tool for learning the International Morse Code. Not only does this little box train you to receive the code, it can teach you how to send clean code as well. The send mode of the MFJ419 acts like a code practice oscillator, allowing you to practice sending Morse code. It displays the characters both in code and in text. The analyze mode setting will display your speed and timing to help you send better code. 
The receive mode of the MFJ419 sends you code to help you learn the characters. It can send with normal spacing or two Farnsworth speed modes, sending the characters faster but spacing to the program speed. There's also a USB text mode that uses a terminal program to send text from a keyboard or a short text file. You listen to the MFJ419 CW Elmer in real time. An exercise mode helps you train to make correct length dits and dies with proper spacing between characters and words. Learning Morse code is just a matter of practice, practice, and more practice. Whether you're just learning the characters or working on high-speed head copying, you'll succeed through regular, frequent practice. The MFJ419 CW Elmer is the ideal tool for learning the code with a wide variety of practice sessions, all sent in truly random fashion and with high quality. Why not let the CW Elmer make your Morse code dreams a reality? Learn more by visiting MFJEnterprises.com today. Another package that arrived just yeah. yesterday evening. Awesome. And it's right here, and this came from Elliot and yeah. uh, his nephew and Elliot Robert. K1MF? I yeah. Think. I'm not sure he's in the chat room tonight. Anyway, he said that you should have a sharp knife ready. Got one. Always. So why don't you pull that up there, open it up, and let's see what they have sent us. They oh, sent us something some a year ago. Some serious tape. It looks like Gorilla Tape. Yeah, there. I think that's what they used last time, too. Man. Tommy, you should be a surgeon. All right, well, I'll stand up. Here you go. Point that knife over that way. <laughs> <laughs> Who let out the cat? <laughs> George, first we had email strippers and dirty code. Where are we going next? No, not coffee. Oh. Well, this stuff is so good, too, man. My son, we drink it. Pumpkin spice? That's good. Okay. Well, they're all actually they're all good and a lot of tea. Let's see, it's not going off there. I'm gonna have to start. Holy wow. moly, that smells so good! Blackberry yep. citrus, they hit the mother load, Mike. I know that would that would keep my wife in tea for a whole month. <laughs> Perfect, Pete. Constant comment. I've always liked that one right there. Peppermint. Ginger peach. Chamomile Cham mint. Mm, chamomile. Just put them all on the top. Yeah, what are you? I'm already, you know. Wow. We can't see them anymore. And there's, there's three big giant bags of coffee in here, too. We're going to nut. We're going to be up all night. <laughs> <laughs> Autumn harvest blend. Oh, that that was really great. It's for opening that. And pumpkin spice. Incredible. George is going to have to fire up Nigel's teapot. And Tommy, you'll need to brew up some fresh coffee. Hope the supply will get you through the holiday season and maybe beyond. Oh, guys, it will. That'll oh, get yeah. us through the holiday oh, no season. No kidding. Good hearing you on your repeater on Friday. I was still using the DVAP pie from episode 57. I told you people were still using that thing. Tasty. <laughs> the audio sounded good on both of you. Hope it gets up running soon with very minimal issues to deal with down the road. Well, yeah, we're working on getting up our D-Star repeater here, and it's almost a reality it just uh, it, it transmits good. It just is kind of deaf, <laughs> but I think we've determined it's a uh, desense issue, and I am working on some stubs. We're going to try putting a stub on it and see if that won't solve it. I uh, thought you might like to see this motley crew. 
And look at there. There is the Motley Crew, Tommy. Oh, cool. Oh, <laughs> oh I'm sorry. I didn't know you were taking yeah, care of it. Yeah, it was Nikki K1MF-K9, Elliot K1MF, oh. and Robert W1CAH. Yeah, Robert checks in on the, uh, the net sometimes. He's usually in the chat room, yeah. too. I didn't see him tonight. Wow, thank you guys so yeah, much. Yeah, thank you. Really yeah. appreciate that. That's awesome. Uh, by the way, Nikki just got out of the shower, and she always wants to take a shower whenever she can. <laughs> Most dogs don't. No. no. <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Elliot, K1MF, Robert, W1CAH, and Nikki, K1MF-K9. Yeah, thank you guys Gee. so much. Yeah. And Nikki. I want to try a little bit of uh, vanilla caramel here. Yeah. And I think, well, it's not Nigel's teapot. I mean, it's in there, but it is not ready to be fired up. However, I believe. You got that nuclear The one electrical, you yes. The, one with the, the electric kettle is. Uh, has been fired up and ready to go. I didn't know for sure what was in there. Let's do it then. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll go get the kettle and uh, whatever we need to go with it. And maybe email will tell us a little bit about uh, the new Brandmeister update for Pystar. Sounds good. Hello, Mike, George, Tommy, and Amateur Logic TV viewers. Do you use Pystar? Do you use Brandmeister for DMR? If so, there's been some recent changes that you might want to know about. And abilities. They, they've had this ability before, but they've made some changes to their API settings for control of the system through your Pystar image. They're on API version 2 now. The biggest thing you really need to know about it is when you are in your Pystar system, you can usually control which group or talk groups that you're listening to or talking on via multiple modes. For instance, DSTAR Networks allows you to change which reflectors you're on, unlink and link them right here from the console, as well as uh, Yesu System Fusion allowing you to change which reflector you're connected to or linked to. Uh, DMR, unless you have this API enabled, doesn't let you do it. You have to pretty much do it from the radio or from the actual dashboard of the Brandmeister console with your own ID and your devices that you have set up. Here, I'm gonna show you basically how to generate that new version, even if you have one of the old ones. They, they're telling people as of August, 2022 to update or go ahead and create this version 2. They're leaving the old one, version 1, up for some time, but they want everybody to update to this API version 2. Eventually, it will be retired, the version 1 API, but they're converting over to another version. There's instructions right here along the way as well um, from Brandmeister on how to do this thing to know about it is that you when when you're done generating this you'll be able to control your hotspot in my case i have the uh, n5boc duplex repeater hotspot basically and it's running on a raspberry pi 4 which is why i can have all of these modes kick in pretty much at the same time the actual way to go about this to set it up is in several menus, both on the console from Brandmeister, as well as in the actual Pystar administrative sections. So if I go to the, actually it's in the configuration settings. If I go to the configuration settings here, you'll see that I have in expert mode, the Brandmeister or BM API setting here. And there is a key you have to generate there. I won't scroll so you can't see my full key. That key 
is once it's placed there, you will have control as, of which reflectors you're attached to at the main configuration or admin section of your Pi Star image. Right there, you can see now I have this group uh, or this manager's console for the brand Meister man, uh, network. Both time slots are activated on my uh, hotspot. Here I can pick one of my favorite talk groups. That's the Louisiana talk group and basically say modify static. It goes out and talks to the brand Meister network and, and comes back and it tells you, you can see there API version two. Okay. So now I'm connected up to that uh, static talk group on slot two, time slot two, you can see here, because that's what I picked. In the Brandmeister side, again, there's instructions that walk you through creating this. Uh, the big difference that I've noticed is that it's not under the self-care option anymore, like the uh, password for your hotspot is, but the uh, it's under the profile settings. There's a button over here called API keys, and you can see it doesn't. It's not revealing anything there, but you generate your API key. You can add uh, keys, revoke them. You have control over this. Create a key and then you copy it from here after you create it and then go back and paste it into that section I was showing you earlier on the configuration expert mode, Brandmeister API, BM API. Once you put that key there and apply the changes, then you'll have these menu settings ability to set that talk group. And of course you can see what's going on also because you, you still have the same control of the hotspot over this interface here from the Brandmeister network that it is one of my static talk groups with a 10 minute limit that I configured directly from the PyStar system here or the manager, the, the Brandmeister manager is what it's called that's actually controlling what's happening here. So you can do it either way here or through the Pi Star console now. Be sure to check that out. They made that change, I think, as of August. And there are instructions as well as why and what they're doing. The website here as of August. So they're wanting to push people to do that. So just thought I'd share that with everybody. Make sure you get that in there. And maybe if you didn't know that uh, possibility or control was there from the Pi Star image, now you do. There are some other things in here too, a repeater, remote com uh, repeater control or readers and other things. They are fully uh, develop the API interface of the Brandmeister network to give you control over what's happening on their network with your devices. And not only can you connect to static groups or static IDs, but you can also remove them as well. So if I want to get rid of that Louisiana connection, I could basically say, get rid of that one there by selecting delete and then modify it. it says okay. Now that static talk group is not there. It is dynamic because I keyed up my radio <laughs> just a minute ago on it. But there you can add and delete static talk groups and or drop all dynamics, which I'll do here. Click that button, wait for it to come back. It says OK. And wait for it to refresh. And there you go. Now there's no static or dynamic talk groups. One uh, feature on that I really love. Um, I know you're limited for time, but the uh, the scheduler that's built into the um, the Brandmeister system is awesome. For I have mine set up so that for the for the nets, it automatically switches over to the appropriate talk groups during the net times. Yep. On the uh, console, right? Yes. Yes. Yep. Red <laughs> Raspberry. No Raspberry Pi, though. Oh. 
Well, they're on obtainium these days. That's true. Yeah, I don't even understand that. It's yeah. been like forever. You can't get them. And the few that are out, people are just like robbing you for them. Well, robbing people that are dumb enough to pay for it. Yeah. I think there's a lot of folks out there that are just discovering Raspberry Pis now since the chip shortage. And uh, they've added to the demand. Well, a little uh, whipped cream on top of that would be nice. I would like an ice cream this flavor. <laughs> well, actually, there is a vanilla caramel ice cream. So well, there you go. Wow. Kind of makes you think of that, the smell. Yeah. Marty, Marty just said that he read the 10-year contract for manufacturing the Raspberry Pis is up. And that another vendor is tooling up to make them now. Oh, oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, I thought they had various ones. I know they used uh, Sony was one. I think of a them. Sony Fab in the UK. Yeah. Um, but uh, I thought they had more than one source that they used. But uh, I could be mistaken. Well, they did initially. The way I understood it. Well, I'll be glad when the zero W two the zero two W, however it is, comes out. I've been trying dying to get one. I've been trying ever since right after they got announced yeah. actually to get one. You just can't find them. I've got a zero. What is it? The zero two W, and I haven't even used it yet. You got the two? Yeah. The the new one? Yeah. That's the one I've been trying to get. Yeah. You're not talking about the. Um, the Nano, the new version of the Nano with wireless. No, I'm right? talking about the Raspberry Pi Zero W. Yeah, but the, the two, the, two version the latest the, one, the Pi Zero. Yeah. Yeah, I've been trying to get one because it's supposed to be a lot faster. I want to swap out one on my hotspot with it and give could, yeah. try the difference. Tom says Speed. a local ham tested him yesterday. He was able to pick up a two gig four B at the local micro center for forty five dollars. Oh, cool. Yeah. I got a two gig four BA two that I haven't used yet. Yeah, yeah, mm. me, yeah. That four I use the four all the time, but not, not the two. Marty says he thinks it was the Sony Fab whose contract ended, and they chose not to renew it. Oh well, well. Uh, Nigel says your tea would taste a lot better brewed in a teapot. It was just would have taken a lot more time. Yeah. That's what um, I was telling you earlier. He being scolded from yeah. the UK. Yeah, yeah. this is uh, that next time, but uh, it's just take a little bit too much time to do that tonight. This is kind of impromptu. An American tea from Connecticut. That's New England. Yep. Well, yeah. They throw all the they threw all the bad tea into the harbor. I hear. Yeah, there was not a <laughs> box of uh, Boston tea in here. So, yeah, they brew that with river water. <laughs> All right. We're going to be back in just a moment. Don't go away. Keep your competitive contesting edge with ICOM. ICOM's high powered base stations cut through pileups, letting you work the bands and record those contacts. Contest from the comfort of your home or remotely with the RSBA1 app. Heard it, worked it, logged it. The IC7300 is a high-performance, innovative HF transceiver with a compact design that will far exceed your expectations. This innovative HF transceiver digitizes RF before various receiver stages, reducing inherent noise in different IF stages. The IC7300 changed the way entry-level HF is designed. RF direct sampling, 15 discrete bandpass filters, large 4.3 inch color touchscreen, real time spectrum scope, and SD memory card slot. The real HF fun starts here. Create your own band opening with the IC9700. This transceiver brings direct sampling to the UHF VHF weak signal world. This all mode transceiver is loaded with innovative features that are sure to keep you busy. Faster processors, higher input gain, higher display resolution, and a cleaner signal. 4.3 inch color touchscreen TFT LCD, real time high speed spectrum scope, and waterfall display. Smooth satellite operation with 99 satellite channels, dual watch operation, and full duplex operation in satellite mode. 
ICOM's IC7610 is the SDR every ham wants. This high-performance SDR can pick out faint signals in the presence of stronger adjacent signals. The ICOM 7610 is a direct sampling software-defined radio that has changed the world's definition of an SDR transceiver. RF Direct Sampling System 110 RMDR Independent Dual Receiver Dual Digicell ICOM's IC7851 gives you a new window into the RF world and is HF excellence unparalleled with faster processors, higher input gain, higher display resolution, and a cleaner signal. It's truly the pinnacle of HF perfection. Dual receivers, digital IF filters, memory keyer, digital voice recorder, high resolution spectrum waterfall display, enhanced PC connectivity, and SD memory card slot. Learn more about all these great ICOM radios at icomamerica.com slash amateur. Hamfest <laughs> picks and forums. So we did have a ham fest down here in Slidell at this awesome venue at our uh, municipal auditorium here. Pretty good uh, group of uh, people and tables. We pretty much sold all of them, if I'm not mistaken. Now, our club's president won the amateur of the year for Louisiana. We have our ARRL leadership there with us presenting him that award. So congrats to K5OZ. He is the guy who made that uh, lightning arrestor, automated pie, you name it. And uh, we had quite a good turnout in our ham fest. I was working the, the uh, front desk for quite a while uh, in the mornings before I had to go in the forums with Glenn to start uh, filming some of those forums. And uh, gave away quite a few prizes here at this ham fest. Got to hand it to uh, the club and the group there. They uh, did good. And, uh, you know, the vendors, um, we had quite a few vendors. They, it's not quite maybe what it used to be um, for us, at least. But we did have a lot of people there with some really good equipment. I was, I was impressed, actually, with uh, what was there. And I did happen to... Uh, Grab something from the sign man there on the left. There were three forums. Uh, Dave, K5OZ, presenting his lightning rig saver. That's what it's called, the, uh, the lightning rig saver. And uh, we've posted these out on our Amateur Logic Facebook. If anybody wants to watch them, there's some presentation files in there included and uh, other uh, things that you can do. There's also a forum from N5EKF in the Ascension Parish Club on CERT community emergency response teams and uh, that was pretty good and also there's me i gave a uh presentation on the digital side somewhat like our last segment all things digital lots going on over here and uh i'm glad to see we're getting back to the uh the ham fest and the forums and that that kind of thing that was it's good to see that back and have it back I should have come to that ham fest. I've forgotten what I was doing that day, but I wasn't. I wasn't able to attend. Yeah, I was, and I was planning on going, but just didn't work out. Yeah. Was there jambalaya? But, yes. There was jambalaya. There was lots of jambalaya. Glenn made sure, and we all got bowls. As you mentioned earlier, our our good friend and everybody's friend, Andy Alpha Alpha Zero Whiskey X Ray, uh, passed away suddenly. I guess um, on November the sixth. So um, don't have too much information, but uh, I threw a little bit uh, together, and uh, thanks to Andy himself, I got a lot of information from his bio page on QRZ.com. <laughs>
rest in peace, Andy. We sure will miss you for a while. Yeah, I mean, that's a shame, man. Yeah. He's such a great guy, like for first class guy. You can't ask for a better friend. No. Mm-mm. God bless him. And and nicely he, done, I didn't Mike. know him. Sorry, go ahead, ML. I was saying, God bless him and nicely done, Mike. Yeah, thanks yeah, for putting that together. I didn't get to know him that well, but um, he he's definitely on my top 10 list for the most interesting people that I've ever met. Oh, yeah. yeah. I saw him in uh, June, I guess, when we went to Florida. I think it was in June. And I stopped by. He called me when he saw I was down there on Facebook and uh, called me. I stopped by and visited him for just a little bit on the way home. Yeah. It'll certainly be missed. Tommy, you have an email here for yeah, us. This is an actual sure email. Enough email. E- yes. Wait. Yeah. Yep. Email? The real thing. It's not an email. No. It's an email. It's not time. a cheap thing. We got an email, too. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Actually, this one's from, I uh, hope I'm not messing his name, Pharrell? Casey Farrell. Farrell? Mm-hmm. Okay, KC0FGX says, congrats on 17 years of Amateur Logic TV. In response to Peter asking if you ever get into Europe on 6 meters, I did not get into Europe um, using all different types of wire antennas and a barefoot 100-watt radio until he built his four-element quad that sits on his roof. He's got a rotor. It's about 20 feet above the ground. Fed directly with LMR 400 coax. And he's about 850 feet above sea level. He was licensed in 1999, and the six meter band was his favorite. Says he built a six meter quad last year in April of 2021. The map that's generated via N3FJP's AC log is a six meter QSOs via FT8, although it doesn't show that uh, that band on the map. He wanted to share the info so Peter can know that. The beam antennas needed to reach out across the water. I've uh, never owned a linear amp, me either, and uh, 100 watts only. He says, you all are awesome. Love your channel. Been watching ever since the first episode. Keep up the great work. He's the one. all you do. He's the one. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, there's a lot of people been watching since the first one. Yeah, those first ones were pretty rough to watch. A little bit. Yeah. But uh, anyway, thanks for sending that. Uh, interesting. I'm sure Peter will see it. Yeah. Well, when we shot those first ones, and we all three, you and Jim and I, got together. I mean, we were shoulder to shoulder, and the and the outer wall was like um, right here. That that building was much. It was less than half the size of this one. It using those packed. little cheap cameras. Yep. Because they're not exp- really. They weren't cheap cameras. at the time, I bet. No, mm-hmm. they weren't. Well, they were cheap as we could find. The, the first ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I could have got some a little cheaper. Well. They weren't the best quality. No. Obviously. But Obviously. they served a purpose. Yeah. You well, still got one of yours right there. Yeah, that's not the first one. That was it's after like a, a couple second, of years like or so. third or so. Yeah. That's but, a, that's a mm-hmm. nice camera, too. That Panasonic. Yeah. GS4 PV GS400. Yep, that was like the the nicest mini DV con, uh, camera consumer. Yeah, yeah model. I had one too. It was incredible. Yep. And now it's worth maybe, might be worth a hundred bucks. I don't know. Probably uh, not. If you find anybody that'll buy it. Yeah, I like the video off of it, man. It's got that authentic television look to it. Interlaced. Yep. We'll fire it up here one night and shoot a show with it. <laughs> how you, I don't know how you're going to hook that up. There's um, no HDMI out on it. I got my ways. You got FireWire to HDMI? No, but I think there's a video out on it. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Hmm. Anyway, well, it's a good show tonight. We We covered a lot of stuff there, and... So nice to have Kay join us and bring us up to date on archive. Yeah, that, that was really interesting. I'm I'm glad they're doing that. That's uh, pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Me too. I'm glad somebody picked it up because um, although there there's a lot of good information, it looked like it was kind of lingering there for a while. 
not much new content was being added for the amateur radio portion anyway. Well, there was, there was no program for that. Now there is. So, uh, yeah, he's heading it up. So oh, I know we're going to have some good stuff. That machine they were scanning with, too, was uh, it was pretty awesome. Yeah, that was really cool. Yeah. I bet that's a hot dog little piece of gear right there. I bet it is. It was fast too, man. You see how fast? Basically, she just put that, yeah. put the glass on. It was done. Time to yeah. flip the page. I mean, there wasn't even time for her to lick her fingers to <laughs> uh, to do the next the next page. There, it was quick. Talk to Jim this week. We're going to get together uh, first of uh, next week and meet an old friend of ours who is a ham as well. And I don't remember his call sign. I hadn't talked to him on the air and a bunch of years so uh cool guy i grew up with so uh we'll be talking with jim and well i guess that's all i got to talk about now what about you tommy i have a lot going on i'm gonna be doing the thanksgiving cooking in my house so you guys say a prayer for my family mm -hmm. and uh, they made it through last year so hopefully they'll make it through this one so are you gonna fry a turkey no i actually uh I'll probably get a turkey, like a smoked turkey. My work gives them out, mm -hmm. so I'll probably use that one. Yeah. That'll make the rest of the stuff. So email? What yeah, about I'm, down I'm there? Doing... Say you, again? Yeah. Well, you're going to have a Cajun fried turkey down there, or what's what's I'm going thinking, on? I'm thinking I'm going to, I may be doing some traveling oh. and with some family, so uh hopefully i could do some portable operations and maybe do some rf fried turkey so mike uh do you expect next month it'll the weather will finally be amenable to antenna work uh i would expect so actually um <laughs> i thought i'd get ahead of the curve this year by doing some antenna work before the weather turned uh kind of colder but um i'll tell you what um for wire antennas, this is the best time of year to put up an antenna because as soon as the foliage comes off the trees, there's none of that stuff to get in your way. Yeah. So it's ideal for that. You're right. I actually need to reshoot mine. If I guess earlier in the year a storm came through. I think it was in the spring, and it kind of shook the rope down off of the limb that had it was across, and I've been kind of waiting to put it back so I won't. You haven't trained those around. squirrels yet to put the antenna back yet? No, they're good at taking them down. They just don't like putting yeah. them up there. <laughs> yep. I've got a little project on the go. Um, I don't know if you can see these. They're, uh, they're little 3D printed rings, and then they have a hole in the side. Oh. Huh. It's a toroid. Well, it sort of looks like that, but... Um, they're they're uh what i'm making is a um uh uhf uh, vhf uh antenna yagi for making a uh, yagi beam for for uh, working uh satellites don't eat too much turkey well yeah i was just gonna say a happy well it's a little a little in advance but happy turkey day and uh don't forget all those uh bargoons on good friday or uh, black friday and cyber monday Ooh. Yeah. yeah, you won't catch me in one of those stores on Black Friday, man. Me neither. Thanks to all, thanks to all the vets again. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. Yes. Definitely. Most definitely. All right. All right. Seven three, everybody. See you next time. Seven three. Seven three. Seven three. My grandfather had a dog named Nicky. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Dog beat me one time. <laughs> <laughs>